The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello, everyone. My name is Andrew Capehart with the Adult Protective Services Technical Assistance Resource Center, or APS TARC, and I want to welcome you to our webinar, Understanding and Fighting the Grandparent Scam, What Aging Network Professionals Should Know to Empower Older Adults. I will introduce our speakers in just a moment. Next slide. Before we get started, I'd like to share a quick disclaimer. This webinar is being hosted by the APS TARC, which is a project of the U.S. Administration for Community Living, Administration on Aging, Department of Health and Human Services, administered by WRMA Incorporated. Contractors and speakers' findings, conclusions, and points of view do not necessarily represent the official policy of the federal government. Next slide. This webinar is being brought to you by collaboration among all of the Administration for Community Living's Office of Elder Justice and Adult Protective Services Resource Centers. You will see those resource centers listed on this slide, and we invite you to visit the websites for each of them to learn a little bit more about what they do. Um, today's slides are available to download where you can access all of these links. Next slide. A little bit of housekeeping before we get started. The handouts and slides, as I said, um, are available in the handouts section of your webinar control panel. You may download them at any time by clicking on the title. Um, please use your computer speakers to access audio for this webinar. Please make sure that the speaker volume is adjusted to your desired volume. If you experience any audio or connection problems during the webinar, what we recommend is that you sign out or close the webinar and then come back in. That typically fixes most of the issues. Next slide. We're planning to have time at the end of the panel discussion for questions and comments, but you may ask questions of our presenters at any time by typing them in the questions box um, of your webinar control panel. We will relay as many of these questions and comments to the speakers as we can when we pause for questions at the end of the presentation. This presentation is being recorded and will be posted to the web at a later date, along with a copy of the slides, and we'll notify everyone who's registered for this event when it is posted online. Everyone attending today will receive an email in approximately 24 hours with a link to download your certificate of attendance. And please be sure to take the brief evaluation survey uh, that's, um, well, that will pop up when we end the webinar. We'd love to hear your feedback. It will also be available in the follow-up email that you'll receive in case you don't get a chance to take it right after or at the close of the event. Next slide. So before we get started, let's get a sense of who is joining us today through a quick attendee poll. I'm going to launch that poll right now. So everyone should have this question on their screen. Which of the following do you identify the most with? And you can vote by clicking directly on your screen. If you're in full screen mode, you may need to exit full screen mode to vote. But again, you can vote by clicking directly on your screen. Um, which of the following do you identify the most with? Social services professional, a legal assistance professional medical professional, a justice professional, or other, if none of those categories really fit for you. So looks like about a third of our audience has voted thus far. So we'll leave this up just a little bit longer so that we get an idea and then we will share um, the results with everyone. I think about 15 more seconds and I'll close it out. So if you haven't voted yet, again, you can click directly on your screen by responding to this poll. And I'm going to close that poll out um, now, and I will share the results with everybody. So it looks like 58% consider yourself social services professional, 13% uh, consider yourselves a legal assistance professional, 3% medical, 3% justice, and 24% other. So we have a lot of other folks today on the line. Thank you for responding to that poll. It really helps us understand who we're talking to. Uh, next slide. It is my pleasure to briefly introduce today's speakers. Um, first, we'll have Eden Ruiz Lopez, an Aging Services Program Specialist at the Office of Elder Justice and APS, Administration on Aging at ACL, U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. We also have Jackie Blase fried Assistant Director, Consumer Protection Branch at the U.S. Department of Justice. Sarah Duval is with us. She's the supervising attorney of the Center for Elder Law and Justice, and also Joe Snyder. Uh, he's the NAFSA Public Policy Chair, and that's the National Adult Protective Services Association and the Financial Exploitation Advisory Board member. So we're really lucky to have all these folks with us today. Um, and I will pass things off to Eden to kick things off. Thank you all so much for joining us for today's webinar and many thanks to the APS TARC for hosting this event. 
we have some stellar elder justice partners joining us to share some insight on unscrupulous networks and individuals and how we could respond to them. ACL, as well as our contractors and resource centers, are fortunate to have a longstanding partnership with the Civil Division Consumer Protection Branch within the Department of Justice. And this webinar is attached to a series designed to equip the broader network of aging professionals with some insight on how to support older people facing grandparent scams and how the DOJ could be of support with their enforcement power. Grandparent scams, whether you've heard about them or not, are evolving quite rapidly. What we've found to be effective in our field and something that has shown promise in combating and remediating grandparent scams is a multifaceted response approach. And what this looks like is not only a response approach that's integrated, but coordinated, person-centered, and person-directed. Traditionally, there are two separate strategies to respond to maltreatment of older persons. The first is essentially going after the bad guys. And the second is intervening to aid those in situations where an adult has experienced abuse, neglect, and or explo exploitation. Today's session promotes a more holistic person-centered practice for all professionals and advocates involved in these types of situations. Response to elder maltreatment is strengthened through partnerships when there are numerous groups or individuals involved, representing enforcement, direct response, human service, and legal services. And them unifying efforts with one another really makes the difference. Greater connectivity allows for a more fortified effort in combating maltreatment and reducing harms. And a key takeaway for today is a sense of how to leverage partnerships and a greater understanding of the benefits of collaboration. Our intent today is for you to learn that there are two sides to scams response and also to learn more about how the DOJ identifies victims and prosecutes scammers who are perpetrating exploitation. Finally, you'll learn how partnering agencies through their multitude of human and legal services provided play a role in helping the people who have experienced scams and how those who have experienced scams have the ability to heal from the detrimental emotional impact and loss that they've experienced. With that, I'm so pleased to be able to turn this webinar over to our partner, Jackie, who leads the prosecutorial efforts through the DOJ. And she could tell you more about what she's come across as of recent. So Jackie, please take it away. Thank you so much, Eden, and thanks to the Administration for Community Living and all of its resource centers for inviting me here today to speak to you all. I really, this is one of my favorite audiences to speak to. You all are on the front lines, dealing with victims, discussing with them what they are seeing, interacting with law enforcement. So I'm really gratified that you've joined us today and very eager to get a sense of what you all are seeing and let you know a little bit about what we are seeing at the Department of Justice level and some of the changes that we're seeing in the grandparent scam over the last couple of years. So if you would advance the slide, please. But before we get really into depth into grandparent scams, I want to take a little bit of a step back and talk about something that I think we all know, but is worth remembering every time we collectively talk about scams. And that's to get a sense of why fraudster succeeds. Why these professional criminals who sit on phones or behind computers all across the world, how they are able to convince millions of Americans every year to send their hard earned savings. The reason they are able to do that is because they are professional criminals. Just like you get good at your job because you do it 40, 50, 60 hours a week, fraudsters are good at their job because this is what they do. 40, 50, or 60 hours a week. And what they have learned over the course of their time in professionally scamming people is the buttons that they can push in order to convince someone who, if they were in their rational thinking mind, might never interact with a fraud scheme to send their hard earned money. And what they do is they hit three main buttons. So almost regardless of the type of fraud scheme that you're talking about or that you're introduced to, I want you to keep these three buttons in mind because these are the buttons that allow a fraudster to succeed. They play on heightened emotion, a sense of urgency, and they try to isolate their victims. So how does this work in the grandparent scam context? How do we see emotion, urgency, and isolation come to play when someone is, is faced with a grandparent scam? If you would advance the slide, please. 
So what we see in a grandparent scam is typically an individual is going to get a call out of the blue. We see two very different kinds of phone calls. Right now, the most common type of phone call we are seeing is the one where the fraudster actually knows little to nothing about their victim. Basically, what they have gotten is a phone number. They don't know anything about that person's backstory. They don't know anything about the person's familial relationships. And basically, they take their cues from their victim. So the way this is going to start is someone's phone is going to ring. And when someone picks it up and says, hello, the fraudster will simply say, grandma or grandpa, and take the cue from the individual they're calling in order to start the fraud ploy. So for instance, if a victim were to respond to that grandma with Charlie, then the fraudster knows that the grandson's name is Charlie, and then they are off to the races. So once that person first answers the call, what's going to happen from there? The way the grandparent scam works and the way that it succeeds is because the fraudster plays on the most base fear that we all have, and that is fear and concern for our loved ones. So the fraudster is going to concoct some kind of story where the individual who purportedly on the other end of the phone, either their grandchild or as we'll see later, someone calling on behalf of their grandchild is in dire consequences. The story that we see most frequently is that the person has been vacationing overseas, is for some reason outside of the country, and something has happened to where that person has become incarcerated and probably charged with a crime. The most common stories that we hear from victims and that we're seeing fraudsters attempt to use is that someone was in a fight and someone was injured, or they were in a car accident, and because of that car accident, someone was injured. And because of that, the person has been charged and they're sitting in some sort of foreign jail cell waiting for some sort of relief from someone in the United States who can help them with their with their plight. The other story that we're seeing, and we especially saw this during the pandemic, was a fear of illness. So we saw victims who came and told us that what they were told when they thought it, they were talking to their grandson or to their granddaughter was that someone was ill frequently with COVID, and that the only way they could get medical services overseas was if the person paid. But again, what they're going to prey on first is that heightened emotion. The fraudster's goal is to get someone in such a state of frenzy or panic or concern for their loved one that they are no longer thinking clearly, that what you sometimes refer to as the lizard brain, our base instincts take over, and we want to act because of that fear, concern, or panic for the loved one. So they play on that heightened emotion and then they're gonna come in with the urgency. The reason that whatever that story is has to happen quickly. So for instance, if the ploy is an, is an illness that someone is overseas, they could be very, very ill. And unless they got thousands of dollars in a short amount of time, they wouldn't get a respirator or they wouldn't get a pill that they needed in order to begin their treatment. Or if someone is incarcerated, then absent the money arriving overseas very, very quickly, they were going to be convicted and they were going to have to remain in a foreign prison for a substantial period of time. So you have the fear followed quickly by that, I have to act quickly, otherwise whatever this dire consequence is, is going to come to pass. And then what seals the deal for most of the victims that we deal with and most of the victims who we find lose significant amounts of money is those who fall prey, unfortunately, to the last button that fraudsters are really good at pushing, which is isolation. And making sure that that individual who has heard this story from the fraudster does not feel comfortable calling another family member, talking to a bank teller, calling local law enforcement, calling any of you to explain the situation. So the way that we see them use this most frequently, especially when we see the foreign incarceration, which again is the most common ploy we're seeing, it's fraudsters are telling potential victims that the case is under a gag order that the judge who's over the proceeding that their grandson or their granddaughter has been subjected to is under some kind of gag order. And that gag order prevents anyone from talking about the case. And if the gag order is violated, then that person is going to remain in a foreign prison in perpetuity because the judge's order that the case not be discussed has been violated. So what does this look like for a victim? They're going to get a call out of the blue. They think it's either their grandson, their granddaughter, a close relative, or someone calling on their behalf. 
there's going to be a dire consequence if they don't send money quickly and they can't talk to anyone else about it. And this is the secret sauce behind a successful grandparent scam, is getting people to where they are so concerned for their loved one that they're no longer thinking clearly. Advance the slide, please. So as I said, it's gonna generally begin with a phone call. One thing that's a little bit unique for a grandparent scam versus a lot of the other fraud typologies that we tackle about the department and that you all deal with every day when you're out working in the field is the grandparent scam is typically something that is relatively short-lived. We rarely see a grandparent scam victim who's falling for the scam or who a fraudster has on the hook for more than a week and it's rarely even that long because usually in that amount of time there's going to be some sort of intervention or some sort of intervening circumstance where they're going to realize that the grandchild really is not overseas or is really not in danger. But what this means for the fraudster and what the fraudster then knows is that they have a short amount of time in order to get a substantial amount of money, to get as most money as they can in a short amount of time, which means that they call frequently, that the escalation asking for additional money happens very, very frequently, and that we will often see fraudsters use multiple type of payment mechanisms in order for people to send as much money as they can as quickly as they can. So it begins with a phone call, it's often not going to last a substantial period of time, but the requests for money are going to be big and they're going to be frequent. So how are we seeing fraudsters request money from their victims? The most common method where we see victims pay a grandparent scam perpetrator is actually via cash. We see lots of victims who are asked to go to their bank, withdraw substantial amounts of money, or to go to their savings, or to go under their mattress, or whatever it is that they keep their cash, to get substantial amounts of cash and then get it to the fraudster. The way that that happens vary by schemes. Historically, the main way that we have seen fraudsters collect this cash was actually by the mail. So we would have fraudsters who would ask victims to package up in a FedEx box, a UPS box, 10, 20, $30,000, and then mail it to an address usually within the United States. Sometimes that address was actually an abandoned house or some place where a courier would then come and pick up a package. But more and more frequently, and one of the reasons we're getting increasingly concerned about the grandparent scam typology, is we're seeing more and more fraudsters who are no longer waiting for the mail. Instead, what they are doing is they are recruiting couriers across the country who will physically go and pick up cash from a victim's house. Now, obviously for the victim, this is especially horrifying. At that point, once someone even realizes that they have fallen for a scam and they have sent their money to a fraudster, probably never to get it back, they also now, not only do they know they've lost their money, but they also know that there's a good chance that that fraudster knows where they live because someone actually physically came to their doorstep and picked up cash. Next slide, please. So if you have an individual who you come across who has fallen for a grandparent scams, what can you do to help prep that individual or help prep that conversation for a conversation with law enforcement so we can hopefully figure out who's perpetrating these scams and get people arrested and brought to justice? Well, the first is that we come across a substantial number of victims who take notes or scribbles during these phone calls. You know, maybe they write down the last four digits of a phone call, or maybe they write down the individual's name who they think is calling, or maybe a date and time. You know, some people don't even realize when they start interacting with law enforcement from the victim perspective that these notes can be critical, but actually they can corroborate what someone is saying and they can help refresh someone's recollection if the trial happens, you know, four or five, six years from the event, when you can show them a handwritten note where they scribble down the name of the individual who was purportedly calling. So ask the individual, you know, while you were talking to this person, did you take any notes? Did you scribble anything down? They might not think it's important because they were just scribbling down the last four digits of a phone number. But from a law enforcement perspective, those notes and scribbles can be really critical towards building a case and making sure that we have a collection of evidence that can get to bring someone to justice. The next thing that often is a misconception, and it's because in most scams, it's actually not that critical, but here it is, is the caller's name. So if the fraudster is pretending not to be the grandson or the granddaughter or the family member, but whether an agent acting on that person's behalf, 
we find that these fraud schemes are using the same fake name consistently. And so it's helping us to link schemes by whatever fraud name they are using in order to talk to their victims. So even if you know it's not real, I know it's not real, and the victim knows that name isn't real, does it matter? The name that someone is pretending to be, John Doe, James Edwards, whatever it might be, can be really critical. Of course, capturing phone numbers and text messages and all of the evidence of the money trail, those are the kinds of things that law enforcement agents are going to ask a victim for. And so you can prep a victim to be familiar with and possibly have that documentation handy during their first conversation with law enforcement. Next slide, please. And Joe, I'll turn it to you. Oh, thanks so much. We have a we have a quick poll. I'm going to administer this poll to everybody. Um, so again, you can vote by clicking directly on your screen. Within the last year, have you dealt with a case that involved a grandparent scam? And the options are, of course, yes, no, not sure. Um, you can vote by clicking directly on your screen. If you're in full screen mode, you may have to exit that in order to vote. Uh, looks like a small portion of our audience has voted so far, so we will keep this up for another 20 seconds or so just to give folks a chance to vote on this. And the question again is, within the last year, have you dealt with a case that involved a grandparent scam? Yes, no, or not sure. We'll leave it up for about five more seconds. And then we'll share the results with everybody. I'm going to close that poll out and share the results now. Um, it looks like 31%, a third of the folks today, we have about 830 people online right now, have, yes, they have dealt with grandparent scam in the past year. 63% no, another 5% weren't quite sure if that's what it met the criteria or not. So thanks so much for voting, everybody. And I think at this point, we turn things over to Sarah Duvall to um, provide her presentation. Thank you. Um, I hope everyone can hear me. Uh, my name is Sarah Duvall. Um, next slide, please. So I'm a supervising attorney at the Center for Elder Law and Justice. We uh, provide free legal services to uh, folks generally over 60. We're based out of Buffalo. We have uh, two satellite offices in uh, surrounding counties. And our unit uh, specifically um, is funded by, um, the work I do is funded by the Office of Victim Services. So um, we help crime victims. And within that, our, we help a lot of victims of scams. Um, I will say I've been in, doing this for about 10 years, and uh, we also handle other types of elder abuse, um, which is more family, friends, neighbors um, abuse. We work very closely with our local adult protective services agencies. Um, we work very closely with law enforcement. We're fortunate here to participate in multidisciplinary teams. And we do a lot of presentations to try to get the word out about scams uh, to, to seniors in the community. Um, but, you know, my goal for this uh, presentation was to talk about how legal services can be utilized um, to help those who have either been the target or victim of scams. I think it's an underutilized resource. Um, and, you know, a lot of legal services um, agencies um, may not realize um, the role that they can help in scam victims. So I just want to say that if anything I am uh, talk about today, um, you, you're, I know we've got, you know, uh, attendees from all over the country. So if there's anything that you hear and you think, oh, I'd love to know more about that, or maybe, you know, our local legal service provider or um, our local office for the aging who may contract with the legal service provider, maybe they would want to talk with Sarah about what we do. I'm happy to do that um, because I have found that even in, again, my 10 years, us um, involving representation of scam victims was pretty new um, because I think, unfortunately, there's this, um, you know, prevention is the best, but if someone has been victimized, um, there's A, a lot of embarrassment or shame to reach out for help. Um, but the impact and the effects of falling victim to a scam um, can, you know, really be uh, detrimental and more than just the initial lost funds. Um, and having some civil legal guidance is very, very helpful to folks so they're not, 
you know, they've already been victimized once and we can help kind of guide them through the landscape afterwards. Um, so next slide, please. So I will go over how our agency assists. Um, and the first is where cases where client is the target of a scam. So one thing we get our calls with people who don't know whether or not they are the target of the scam. Um, we even uh, both uh, clients themselves, um, partnering agencies, we get you know emails from local office for the aging, senior services, adult protection, hey, we think this might be a scam, but we're not sure. So we can assess whether or not this is a scam. Um, in some ways, CellJ functions as almost like a local scam clearinghouse because we do get so many calls and we give so many presentations in the community and we partner with so many different agencies on these scams. Um, you know, for example, if a client received an email that looks suspicious but could be legitimate, we help the client to contact the agency or bank directly. And we also assist clients by we will report the suspected scam to the Federal Trade Commission via our legal services portal. This is a relatively um, new development in that um, the FTC has um, partnered with legal services agencies across the country to kind of centralize the reports that we are getting. Um, instead of uh, seniors submitting individually or victims submitting individually, they certainly can do that. But we actually have a special portal where all of the reports that come to Center for Elder Law and Justice, we can submit directly to the FTC. Um, and then we get, actually get reports from them um, about what kind of scams are, are happening in our area. Um, I've noticed that especially with the grandparent scam, it seems like a certain area will be targeted. And then too, sometimes we can partner with um, getting the word out just to, we're, we're hearing an uptick in grandparent scams in this area. So just, you know, as a re-education for, um, for, for seniors in our community. Next slide, please. Um, cases where the client is a victim of an ongoing scam. Um, so these are where somebody has either, um, you know, given some inf some identifying information before they realize that um, they may have been, this may be a scam, or they have actually given funds either, um, I know that gift cards are, are slowly, are still an issue, but are being, you know, replaced by cash. Um, if funds were mailed, we can work to contact the postal inspector, our local postal inspector, and see if there's anything they can do to, to you know, trace those funds. Um, again, we can report to the FTC. We report to law enforcement, especially if there's an in-person in interaction. You know, we always encourage our, our clients to report to law enforcement, and a lot of times, though, unfortunately, they'll do a report, and it's, it's either um, they have difficulty sometimes even making a report, and so that's where we can help in and step to advocate. Um, we also, you know, advise the clients on next steps for protection. So the likelihood of follow-up scams. This is something we see with almost um, um, every client who's been the, tar the target of a scam. They're at increased risk for additional scams, but also specific follow-up scams. Um, we see clients who uh, get targeted um, by, they get, you know, what they think are letters or emails from the FBI saying, um, we know you were the victim of a scam, we'd like you to help us catch the scammer, and so we're going to ask you that you interact one more time with the scammer because we're on the case, or that they are eligible for funds from a victim fund, and they just have to get a, you know, debit card, and they'll be able to make withdrawals from a victim fund, stuff like that. Um, you know, long term, certainly client may wish to change their number. We can help them with services um, like no more robo or, you know, services to help, you know, screen out some of the scam calls, provide guidance on identity theft. Um, so we will, uh, every client we get, we offer that we will help them to run a credit report. And credit reports are so important. Um, especially if you believe your identity has been compromised. Um, we can see it to see if there are any lines of credit out, any unfamiliar addresses or phone numbers associated. And we can assist in freezing credit or putting a credit alert uh, for the client's name. Again, just, just to help to limit the damage or, or stop the damage um, if they're in an ongoing scam. So uh, next slide, next slide, please. 
And then, you know, clients who may have been scammed in the past but dealing with the fallout now, you know, legal issues arise due to the loss of funds from the scam. Um, so we are seeing a lot of clients who, yes, they, they lose cash, and that certainly is, is a problem, but we are also seeing clients who um, try to take out lines of credit, try to get a, a quick loan from a bank or, uh, you know, are even asked to give credit card information out um, or open lines of credit um, for uh, scammers. And then the problem is... Um, once the the scam is over, um, the the lines of of credit uh, and, and debt is in in the client's name, and that becomes um, a strain on them. Uh, a lot of folks don't have the funds to um, pay back the 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 debt, and then they're in collections, and it's very very stressful. So we do intervene um, and try to advocate on behalf of the client. We will. Um, you know, advise them on their rights. Every, you know, consumer rights vary across the country, but in New York State, we have some consumer protections. We advise um, the clients that they're protected. We will complete fraud affidavits where appropriate, especially if identity has been, been stolen. Um, in cases, unfortunately, where the client has taken out a loan and, um, you know, the client themselves took out the loan and it may have been for what they thought was, you know, the need to help a grandchild, but, um, you know, wasn't. Uh, we we will try to work um, on filing uh, debt verification, hardship waivers, fraud affidavits, um, just so the client themselves are, isn't the subject of the debt collection. Um, and, you know, we can help them, again, place a credit freeze. So we take on the burden of communicating with the debt collection agencies um, and uh, all, all that to, in an effort to avoid a lawsuit. But sometimes it can bounce to clients who are sued on the debt. And in that case, we will actually go as far as to provide representation in court to try to avoid a default judgment and see if there are any defenses um, to to the debt collection. And again, these are effects that go long after the scam that a lot of folks might not realize that they're eligible for some legal services to help. And I just want to put the word out there that, you know, legal services are available um, and they may be available in your area. If they're not, you know, it might be something to, to try and, and, and work towards. Uh, next slide, please. Thank you so much, Sarah. At this point, I think we'll turn things over to Joe Snyder. Thanks, Andy, and thanks to ACM and APS Torque for having us today, and thanks to my colleagues, Sarah and Jackie, who are partners on the webinar and represent partners in real life for an APS um, worker. So I couldn't tell from the, um, from the poll exactly how many people would know what APS is, so forgive me if you know this, but let me just say that APS, Adult Protective Services, is a single dedicated authorized victim service system for older and vulnerable adults, victims who live in the community. About half the states, APS also does investigations in institutions. And um, in most of the states, the majority of states, you must have a disability or an incapacity or whatever the term of art is. Um, and then there's a, a, a few states where it's age only. So as, as those of you who've worked with APS know, it's different in each state. Um, so I just want to put that out to start. And next slide, please. So the role of adult protective services is to first get the case and then decide whether to screen it in and then assign the case. So we're going to go in this case that we've gotten a case, we screened it in, and we're assigning a case, and we're making a home visit. And um, when we go to the home visit, we're going to, of course, um, interview the, the alleged victim. We're going to interview, if possible, at the same time, or at later date, collaterals and informants, and get as much information as we can, as my other two partners have have shown in their examples. And we're also going to be looking at if we can, you know, if, if 
when we make our decision to substantiate or not, um, what services may be necessary. And services can, can vary um, with a wide range of services. For instance, if we go to the house and we also found that we're in a house of somebody who's a self-neglector, who's not taking care of themselves in their place, maybe we add those services because there's a lot of moldy victimization in our cases where it's not just exploitation, but it might be abuse and neglect also, even self-neglect. Um, and uh, maybe there, maybe we get a hint that their capacity is not what it should be, especially maybe their financial capacity is starting to fail. So maybe we might order a psychological avail. Um, and, and there's other services that this, this is a tough thing to go to. So my, a colleague of mine, um, mother fell for the, the grandparent scam. And um, she came to me and asked me what she could do. And her mother lived in another state. And I called my friend in another state. I told her to make my colleague to make a report. And in this particular state, they also had a, uh, a multidisciplinary team in the locale. So they had law enforcement. They sent law enforcement to her house um, to interview her at some point. And she was reluctant to let them in. She wanted to see their badge. And they said, well, here's our badge. They said, well, anybody can have a fake badge. Said, well, there's our car with the, you know, the police light on it so that anybody can buy one of them. And my colleague said her mother was the life of the party and very gregarious and trusting of everybody before this. And this really shattered her. And it really changed her life beyond, fortunately, it was only a little bit of money um, before she discovered and talking to her daughter that her grandson was home. Um, so it didn't, it wasn't the money piece, but it was much more than the money piece. It was the trust um, in, in everyone. And um, so, so in that case, you know, APS was able to recommend and get some counseling for her. Um, but that, you know, there, in, in some of these cases, there's, there's really no winner. Um, some of these aren't, you know, they're not happy ending stories. So we're always looking at that. We're always looking at um, what referrals can we do? And, and we can do a wide range of referrals. Next slide, please. And of course, if you're on a, in, in an area where, where you're on and have or are on a multidisciplinary team, this becomes you know, the easier thing to do because you're all sitting at the table. So you can have partners like, like Sarah and Jackie representing the table law enforcement legal service providers. And it makes it um, easier to go through this process. Um, and, the, and as Sarah mentioned about the legal service providers, they are a natural partner for APS. And I was fortunate in Philadelphia. Um, I retired in 2018, but I had three legal service providers in the city. And I worked really closely on a lot of cases with two of them. Um, and it, it, it was all the things that they can do. And you heard Sarah say what they can do. And even though some of the things that Sarah said and Jackie said as far as investigation services are maybe duplicative of what we do, it's always a good thing to, to, for somebody to hear these multiple times because this is devastating. And, and you know, going through this is rough for anybody, but especially when you've been victimized. So to hear that again, but the legal service providers um, and, I, and that FTC portal is, is a great thing because this is a hard, as we said, this is a hard thing to go through for anybody, really hard if you're a victim and to have somebody to help guide you through that is amazing. And much like uh, my colleagues again said before, APS will be looking when they interview the victim to, to look at the money trail, to look at any notes they have, to, and the names, the money, um, the financial institutions, where they have accounts, anything to, to put that, put everybody on alert and make sure that the victim and the family is helping with that so we can go there. So legal service providers, are, again, they're natural for APS and we use them a lot. And as Sarah said, if you don't have them, she's offered to to you know her her help, um, law enforcement, um, you know the FTC, the FBI, they all do a great job. A lot of locales have detectives. More and more specialty um, law enforcement partners are are 
being born daily. And this is a special skill to sit and talk to victims, older victims alone, but older victims of these kind of scams. And it really helps when you have somebody that has that kind of experience. And, you know, we use law enforcement um, often. And if, you know, sometimes it's really easy to get these partnerships and sometimes it's not. And I just say to all, no matter what, what discipline you're from, APS or others, if you don't have one, start one. If not you, then who? Step up and start one because it makes all the difference. If we've learned anything, we've been doing this together forever and we still have billions of dollars being lost every year. So we, get, we always need to improve on what we're doing. And the best way to improve, and we've learned, is to work together as a team. Next slide, please. As I've said, I think you've heard from me enough now, partnerships are the key. Uh, no matter how good you are at your individual discipline, you can always learn more, and it really helps when you have a legal service provider taking your client through the FTC portal for the additional, um, the additional support that they need. And, and law enforcement is, is, as Jackie said, and others, even though the justice may not be immediate, and it may be years down the road, you may be helping identify a ring and you may be helping um, other people um, for you, even though when somebody comes to your house and picks up cash, you're probably never going to see that again. We get that. And of course, we all know that prevention is the best medicine. So there's a lot of things out there in preventative. The Better Business Bureau has stuff. The FTC has stuff. The FBI has stuff. We all have stuff. Um, one of the things uh, that, that a few years ago, my partner, Gary Brown, from the Attorney General's Office of the State of New York, who was on NAPS's Financial Exploitation Advisory Board, uh, that Alpha's team with the Alive Inside crew, who does some great videos, and did a video on the grandparent scam. And it's a bunch of high schoolers talking to their grandparents on the video um, and saying, you know, this is the scam. And so here's how we're here, here's how I'm going to help you. Grandma, grandpa, ask the person on the call a question only you and I would know. What was the name of my first dog? Um, let's put together a password. So you ask the caller what the password is, and if they don't say it, hang up immediately. And within that video, and, and it will lead to other videos, there's Dr. Ruth Westheimer, the famous sex therapist, who almost fell victim to the grandparent scam. And when she was talking about that, she was contacted by the AG and Alive Inside if she would participate and, and talk about what it is, because, you know, it's easy to feel dumb it's easy to feel embarrassed but you're a victim and as, as jackie said in the beginning these are professionals who are working as much as we work or working around the clock sitting in boiler rooms making these calls they're great at what they do and everything that we know they know so in order to to do this we work together and of course the prevention is the key and um really hope that we all take advantage of the stuff that's out there. Um, and I think that's the end of my slides. Yes. Thank you so much, Joe. And I think we will turn things over to Jackie now to um, facilitate our case study discussion. Yeah, if you would go to the next slide, please. So we just want to spend a couple minutes with you talking a little bit through a case study just so you can see how this works in practice, not only the scam itself, but also the potential collaborations that you might have in the community. And I totally agree with what both with what Joe has said, where he ended is where I want to start. Find your allies in the community because there is some beat cop who is passionate about elder fraud. There is someone in the state AG's office who's passionate about elder fraud. There is someone everywhere who's passionate about elder fraud. And it can take time to cultivate those relationships, but it's really worth it. So what we wanna show you through these scenarios is both how that works and also how those partnerships are going to play out. I'm not gonna read, I'm gonna summarize what's on your screen. And then we're just gonna very quickly, each Joe and I will talk a little bit about how we might interact with this and then we'll leave a little bit of time for questions. So 
our person is Ruth. Ruth is this 86 year old woman who lives alone. She has three children. And one day she receives a call from someone claiming to be her grandson, Charlie. The caller explains that he doesn't really sound quite like Charlie because he's gotten into a fight when he was overseas. And as a result of that fight, he's been detained by authorities. So at this point, the fraudster is going to do something that's really smart. Charlie's going to get off the phone. And instead, the attorney or the agent who's working with Charlie is going to get on the phone. So at this point, someone from the foreign government is going to confirm Charlie's story. And it tells Ruth that unless Ruth sends $5,000 to an address in New York so Charlie can pay bail, he has to stay in jail. The agent also tells Ruth that Charlie's case is under a gag order, and if she tells anybody, then Charlie could remain in custody indefinitely. Ruth is terrified. She has that heightened emotion. The situation is urgent, and she can't. She doesn't feel like she can talk to anyone. So she feels like she probably has no choice but to take the money from her account, and she sends it to the address in New York. Next slide, please. Now, as we talked about, the fraudster is going to move quickly, right? Ruth sent the money, so there's going to be another request very quickly for more money. So someone is going to call again. It's not going to be Charlie again. It's going to be someone acting on Charlie's behalf, this time an attorney. And because the person who Charlie was in the fight with has been injured seriously, had to have surgery, the charges have escalated. And now the bill is $20,000. And because it's $20,000, they're very worried about this amount of money. So they're actually going to send a bail agent directly to Ruth's store to make sure that they get the money as quickly as possible so they can get Charlie out of jail. So someone by the name of James Edwards is going to show up to Ruth's store. He's going to remind her about the gag order. And James Edwards, this purported bail agent, is actually going to show Ruth what look like legitimate credentials. He's going to take the cash and then leave. So the next day, Charlie's mother calls, and Ruth can't help but ask how Charlie is doing. And it does, she finds out that Charlie is fine. He's in the next room. Ruth realizes she's been scammed. And Ruth's daughter is going to call Joe at APS to see if there's anything that Joe can do. OK. And and, jo and again, imagine how, how she feels the moment she realizes that she's been scammed. And and what that means. So Joe will take the call, screen it in, go out and talk to our victim and start the process um, of documenting and starting the process of the money trail, starting the process of seeing whether services are there. And in this case, it seems like, at least from, from the details we have, that Ruth is a person who doesn't like capacity, doesn't sound like she's a selfie collector. It sounds like this, we were dealing with this grandparent scam. And as my colleagues have said, these can be one and done. And it, the damage may have been done, but we still want to make sure that, um, that they don't come back for her. And so we're going to talk about um, what things they need to do to protect themselves and what other experts they need in this case. And again, going back to the experts that, that, that we that are on the screen, um, I would, after um, meeting with her and deciding um, she, she needed further help, I would refer her to legal service providers who are, you know, not only the FTC portal, but are experts in um, consumer protection law and a bunch of other things that APS is not an expert in, and hopefully start the preparation for discussion with law enforcement, you know, enforcing with Ruth, that she's a victim and to not feel horrible about it. And um, we want to try to get her justice. So they would definitely be um, the two referrals that, that I think I would make right away. And I would then have, the, have Ruth call Sarah, and then Sarah would take it. Hi, yes. Um, so you know, when we when we got that call, we would certainly, you know, try to see work with our, you know, law enforcement as, you know, coordinate with APS if if the if a referral to law enforcement had already made been made by APS, or we would see if there's anything we could do, go to the house with APS. Sometimes we would do joint visits too, um, if that's helpful. Um, especially if there was a safety or security concern because the, um, you know, that someone had actually gone to her home. We found with clients who have this happen 
that they are incredibly afraid that that some that they you know they could be a target as Jackie mentioned earlier that they may be um, at risk right it's it, it, it contributes to a feeling of insecurity um, and so we would address that we may do even something like a safety plan with her if somebody does come you know do you have a life alert just so she felt more reassured we would go over the um, likely that even though this scam she may not be you know this scam might not be ongoing but because she has fallen victim it's likely she may be a target for future scams and we would go over um, go over that information with her in addition to the you know cash withdrawal we would just check did they get, did she give any other information you know she had taken cash out of the bank but did did she remember was there anything that she asked on the phone and did they she verify any information on the phone um you know run that credit report with her and just you know offer those services of you know the fraud alerts or you know potentially freezing credit just in case because um even by confirming information on the phone, she could have given um, these scammers information they may try to utilize um, down the line. And yeah, I think that our, our main focus would certainly be just trying to um, see if, if anything could be done by, you know, coordinating with law enforcement, you know, coordinating, referring to the FTC, um, and then to work on protecting her moving forward. Um, I would say that, you know, a police report here is critical um, because in, in New York State, especially if she's elderly, that, that $20,000 is not only money that she has lost potentially, you know, herself, we have to look at it that way, but also um, if, if it, you know, in terms of, you know, receiving health care, you know, receiving, you know, Medicaid down the line, we want to make sure there's documentation that this wasn't. Um, that this was withdrawn, you know, for because she was a victim of a crime, um, and that's you know that's really how how we would handle it. Um, I can you know turn it over to to Jackie for her perspective. Yeah, thanks so much, Sarah and Joe. And you know, I think from there, you know, if, like they both said, the report is hopefully going to get to law enforcement. I I will say, and we certainly hear this too, that occasionally we hear that when victims or APS or legal aid tries to make a report to law enforcement, sometimes they're told that it's a civil matter and not anything that they can do, or there's no point in making a report. First of all, understand that we're doing a lot of education with people as to why that's not the case. And even when it's a small victimization or it is somebody overseas, a report needs to be taken. But I will say with this this particular typology, we don't find that response at all. In fact, we find law enforcement's very eager to take reports. There's often local people who can potentially be arrested. So both at the state, federal, and local level, you know, hopefully we're going to be able to investigate. You know, hopefully Sarah and Joe have maybe had some preliminary conversations. They've worked with them to collect some of that documentation. They've worked through some of the initial fears that a victim might have had in working with law enforcement, because that is an obstacle that we have. And so often if we have someone from the social service side come in first and then we come in after that can sometimes help that first interaction with law enforcement so you know we're obviously going to take the information we're going to investigate see if there's anything that we can do to prosecute and if the entry point is us instead of Sarah or Joe and we know that either Sarah or Joe's services is needed of course we'll do what we can to make referrals to APS to legal aid and to other elder justice professionals that we have allies with in the community and with that I think I'll turn it back over to you Andrew Thank you so much, Jackie. Um, so it looks like we have just a few minutes left. We're not going to be able to get to all the questions because there are quite a few questions, quite a few comments. Um, but one that I will start with, um, and this is for Sarah. Sarah, do you have FAST teams in New York? These are financial abuse specialist teams. Again, do you have FAST teams in New York? So I believe that that is something that's coming down. I'm not on one currently. Um, I've heard the acronym and I think that it's something that is coming down with our enhanced multidisciplinary teams, um, but it's not something that I'm currently sitting on. Certainly, thank you so much. And this is a question I guess for anybody, but maybe possibly for Jackie. Are there efforts underway nationally and internationally to shut down these activities to protect individuals and families from the damages? not unlike credit card scams. National efforts could include reciprocity and standardization across state laws. 
So absolutely, there certainly are national and international um, efforts to shut down a really wide range of scans coming from all different corners of the world. I spend about as much time talking with foreign law enforcement these days as I do local law enforcement, in part that's because of sort of where I sit within the department's infrastructure. But, you know, we have regular conversations with other countries who are facing similar problems because often a call center that targets the U.S. will also target Canada. And we also have lots of conversations with foreign law enforcement where some of these schemes are coming from. So absolutely, I spend a lot of time talking with headquarters at FBI, headquarters at USPIS, um, you know, local law enforcement trade associations, as well as foreign law enforcement to see how we can tackle these schemes, not only from the victim side and from those here in the US, but also the perpetrators who are often sitting in foreign call centers. And they feel some degree of security because they are sitting overseas and we're doing everything we can to make sure that feeling of security uh, is not one they should have. Excellent. Thank you so much, Jackie. Um, another question, and this is a good one. I've, I've, this occurred to me as well, and this is for any of our panelists if they're aware of it. Where do criminals get phone numbers for older people, and what can elders do to make their contact information less available? You have hit on one of my favorite topics, which <laughs> is the concept of the lead list. Um, and it, very, it really does vary scheme by scheme, but I will say one thing to be cognizant of is if you've heard Joe, Sarah, and I all talk about re-victimization, understand that once someone falls victim to some kind of fraud scheme, that name, that contact information becomes incredibly valuable, not only to the fraudster because they got money from that individual, but we actually see sales of these lead lists to similar fraudsters and to other kinds of fraud schemes. So that's one reason that after someone, you know, first answers a government imposter call, all of a sudden they're getting dozens more government imposter calls. That's most likely because that fraudster who they paid $500 has sold their name to dozens of other fraudsters who are doing similar or even the same kind of scheme. We see this with a wide range of schemes. We see it in uh, lottery fraud, government imposter, and also in the grandparent scam. So that's one thing to keep in mind is fraudsters, just like we have networks, they have networks, and they use those networks to sell people's information. Certainly also we see people get information from the dark web via hacks where you know, someone's information has gotten loose via some sort of data breach. And there is even at times you know, people who uh, sell durable medical equipment lists, for instance, which often has the names of older adults on it, and those get into the hands of fraudsters, and then they monetize them by making phone calls based on those lists. So it's a really wide range of ways, and that's why we have to keep people in mind and help them you know, figure out when to answer the phone, when to not, and most importantly, when to hang up the phone. Great. Thank you, Jackie. And here's one, one last question, I think, before we wrap things up, and a very good one. Uh, prevention is key, as Joe Snyder stated, and educating older adults about these scams. What is the best way to get the word out to older adults to prevent them from responding to these scams? And that could be for any of our panelists if you have suggestions for educating the public. Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. And, you know, beside the local, there, there's a, a one of my new favorite studies that can give you some insight to that is something called Expose the Scam, What Separates Victims from Non-Victims. And it comes from um, the FINRA Foundation, the Better Business Bureau, and the Stanford Center on Longevity. And it talks about what scams are most successful and what kind of outreach is most successful and why some people get victimized and why some do not. So I would really look at that. There, It's a variety. I mean, the, the way we communicate um, more and more older people are on the, on the internet, on the web. Um, local news uh, from a trusted person still is a big deal. Um, so, so, you know, I, I would take a look at that study. Uh, I think it has a lot of information. In it. Thank you, Joe. Well, and we are now at the top of the hour. So uh, next slide, I think we will go ahead and wrap things up here. Sorry, we did not get to all the questions. There were many of them. So we'd like to thank all of our panelists for sharing this fantastic information with us today. And we'd like to thank all of you, the attendees, for coming today and listening. We hope you found it informative. Uh, please remember to complete your webinar evaluation at the end of this event. And um, again, thanks for attending. Have a great day.